It's been a crazy week for me, um, and in fact, upcoming is another crazy week, uh, actually pulling me out of town. So I have this little window of opportunity to show you how this Mark 7 is different than a Mark 5. And uh, I was cleaning this up a little bit, putting some wax on it, and the thought occurred to me, I should check to make sure that this thing works. And I uh, plugged it in and hit the power, and <laughs> yeah, that's what I was greeted with. So I'm gonna check this, <laughs> hopefully it's just a pinch belt. It may be a capacitor. All right, no such luck, the belt is not pinched, and so we're gonna to have to move forward using our imagination a little bit. So you know the five features or five basic functions of a Shopsmith Mark V being the table saw, the disc sander, the drill press, the horizontal boring machine, and the lathe. The Mark VII does all those things, but it added to that mix two more tools. Now it also accomplishes those other functions in a unique way. So let's first take a look at the two additional tools that we get with this. The first one being kind of sort of obvious, you notice it has a square base on the bottom. A lot of people think that that's a vacuum and it's part of a vacuum cleaner. Part of the vacuum cleaner is this impeller that's mounted onto the headstock. Every time you turn this machine on, regardless of whether you want to run a vacuum or not, that impeller is running. Now, over the years, people complained about that impeller um, causing, well, just the, the resistance from the air is causing the one and an eighth horsepower motor to lose some of its power. So you'll often find that that, uh, that entire housing and that impeller has been removed. Um, it does have a shaft that comes out of the side of the machine, which usually you see intact. What's happening on the base though is storage for a, uh, a vacuum bag. So the way you'd see this operated is you would have a hose coming from, let's say your lower saw guard or wherever you're vacuuming from into the center of that impeller. And then it would be ejecting to a shorter hose that would blow down into that, uh, that cabinet below, filling that fabric or cloth bag. I don't have any of the bags and in fact, my brother-in-law stopped using this or maybe never used it as a vacuum. So he's been using the space down below for storage, but I'm thankful that he left the impeller intact. Okay, so what are the other features? Um, the, the, let's say the vacuum is function number seven. Function number six then would be the fact that you can do under table shaping. Now this is something we accomplished with the modern Mark VII because that machine will tilt both directions as does this one. So first, let's go to the drill press position so you see how that functions, because it pivots differently than a Mark V. Um, I say that because a Mark V pivots at the end of the machine. This one is pivoting about a foot in. So to use this as a drill press, you would tilt the table 90 degrees, or whatever it is you're trying to tilt it to. And we'll just lock that down, make sure the carriage is locked. We'll do our five-point safety check as always. Oh, this handle that locks the headstop is a flip stop, and it also gives me the ability to crank the headstock up and down the, the, the way tubes. The earliest version of the Mark 7 featured a very similar type of adjustment right here on uh, the height adjustment. I'm, I'm thankful that this one has this version because this was the newer version. So with this setup, we're going to lift it just as we normally would the Mark V. And if you're a man of my height, you might notice that that puts this headstock very low. Normally my headstock is up closer to my eye height. And more importantly, my table is really low. Uh, maybe, depending upon what I'm, what I'm drilling, that might be a bit higher up. But still, that's really low for me. Let's go back down and let's go to the shaper setup. Oh, by the way, there is a latch at the bottom. If you want to, you can latch this in that position. Likewise, over here, in the under table shaping position, there is also a latch that can be used. We're going to tilt the table 
over here. And this is something that's different than the, the new Mark 7. The new Mark 7, in order to accomplish this, yeah, it tilts both directions, but the table doesn't tilt all the way from one side to the other. Uh, the table only goes 45 degrees one way and 90 the other. So for, uh, for that to work, Shopsmith had to mill the, um, uh, the grooves that make up the rack on these table tubes. They had to mill that on both sides of that and you take the table out and flip it over in order to use it under table shaping. So let's drop this down. We would, uh, we would put a shaper arbor here on the end of the spindle. Bring the table down to whatever position we want. Of course, we still have the ability to adjust this in and out of the quill. And, and I can tell you right now that, that that headstock for me is going to be low. Um, where that headstock is located right now is going to make that machine want to tip over all on its own. And I guess to some degree that's good. But then it puts it all really, really low for me. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to slide everything off to the right a bit. And again, I can do that by loosening the carriage lock. I can loosen this. And then I can actually slide them both by turning this crank. And lock down again. Release this latch. And now this will tip up. Actually, still plenty of weight down low to make this thing want to stand up on its own. And there we have shaping from beneath the table. Pretty slick. Another thing I can tell that's, uh, that tells me that this is one of the more recent units is originally they didn't have that connector there between the two legs, well, right there between the two legs. That was something that was added at some point. I think I have the, the nameplate that's missing from there. All right, let's get in close and see what's different about this machine than the Mark V. Um, first off, I have a reversing switch. There's a key that allows me to lock it. If I lock that, it can't start. Put the key in, turn it to the right, it'll turn on and forward, and will only go into reverse by pressing or turning the key to the left. So that's a handy safety feature. Also, it was unique and uh, prone to failure. So that's one of those things, if you find yourself a Mark 7, that may be an issue. Uh, they also made all of these controls and locks and levers um, quite sharp. You can see here that they made it look more like, uh, like a jet wings, a delta wing. And that's very uncomfortable to me. So, you know, if, if this were my primary tool, I might swap out these, uh, these locks and controls with the Mark V version. Now, here's where things get really weird. Instead of having a crank, where you're turning a crank to change the speed and a dial that's moving independently of that crank, this is dialing and is moving a cam on the inside of the machine and it's a direct connect. And when you turn this, and I'm gonna turn this, I'm going up in speed. It's the only way you can safely do this with the machine off, is it kind of clicks. See that? Now let's take a look at what's happening on the inside. All right, so in order to access the speed control mechanism, we're gonna pop this name tag off the back. You can see it's held in place with a couple little springs. And then you can see what's going on inside. What we have there is a plastic or nylon eccentric cam. And uh, I'm gonna go ahead and again, turn the dial, increasing the speed. And you can see going in this direction, it's pulling on that, that shaft. Um, if I were to slow the speed down with this off, it would be compressing and pushing against the V-belt, which would be a problem. Anyway. This is uh, one of the problems with the Mark 7, and that is, you know, it was kind of way ahead of its time on the use of plastics. And that nylon, if you don't keep everything properly lubricated here, you can get a lot of heat built up if you're doing some high-speed shaping or routing for long periods of time. That cam can melt 
or if you're not keeping things properly lubricated and sliding easily, you could be putting a lot of force on the little bearing that's underneath here. All right, another spot that was an issue, and you already saw me cranking the headstock along this rack. This rack is uh, attached in a couple pieces onto the way tube, and that rack will also break. If you're cranking that down and forget to unlock anything, uh, especially if we're talking in the dead of winter, you can break this. Additionally, the, the V-belt on the inside can flap against this, and if you're not paying attention, can actually uh, wear it down. Another interesting feature that's not working quite right here is this little button normally is popped out and then you can see that shaft that's sticking out of the carriage and you can slide this in and engage that and latch on either here, here, or here and locking the headstock and the carriage together. Then using that crank that you saw demonstrated early, you can move the headstock and carriage up and down the way tubes together. So I suspect that that's something that I can correct on the inside, probably just a spring. Another unique feature is this L-shaped extension table. Mounts onto the end of the machine just as any extension table would mount on a Mark V. But in addition to that, it has one more trick it can do um, by, I can show you this by tilting this table back. You'll see that I have a spot here on the main table where I can insert this and then lock that down with a couple knobs. So now, as you can see, so now you can see I've expanded the width of the table and without being attached to the base of the machine, moving with me as I raise and lower the table, this extension table or floating table, if you will, is going to travel with the main table, regardless of the angle, regardless of the height. Uh, a really cool feature here. Additionally, you can see that there is an extra slot. That this uh, could have a table saw insert here. Ha by having an extra slot in the table, I can bring my saw blade up through here, increasing my width of cut between the fence and the blade by roughly six inches. There's also a couple holes through the top of the table. That's for mounting the shaper fence, just like we do with the 510, 520 shaper fence. One of the things I had read but didn't have any personal confirmation of was the fact that even without this extension table, the Mark 7 table is said to be larger than the Mark 5 Model 500. So here's a Mark 5 Model 500 table. You can see it is exactly the same width, but when I align this, front to back, sure enough, we're picking up another couple inches to the front of the table. All of the accessories, but I do have many of them, including this fence that is kind of weird. It works just like the Mark V Model 500 fence, but the clamping of it is done through the use of this lever. Press the lever down, and that one's not going all the way down. I'll have to adjust something on that. The, uh, the tail stock, the tool rest, and a few other parts also have kind of an angled or angular shape to them. Again, kind of goes along with the angular shape of the headstock. Here's the tail stock. And it also came with this sanding disc, and not all of them did. Not all of them had the sanding disc that has a back bevel. So this is actually a tapered sanding disc. Um, kind of, sort of works like the tapered disc that Shopsmith sells today, only the taper is facing the headstock. So you'd have to bring this up through the slot in the table, tilt your table to match that angle, and uh, it would give you a very narrow support for that. And then the one part that's missing is the complete miter gauge. And the miter gauge on the, uh, 
the Mark 7 is essentially the same as a Mark 5 miter gauge, only instead of having a knob to tighten underneath the pistol grip, it has, again, kind of that, uh, that delta wing concept where you can push down a cam from either the left or the right side. Um, I'll, I'll wind up with one of those eventually. But the cabinet below is filled with all kinds of Magna goodies, including some parts for the Shopsmith Sawsmith radial arm saw. In fact, right there in front, one of the first things I saw, that is an arbor for a Sawsmith radial arm saw. I'm hoping to get all this cleaned up and up and running soon, and for sure, I'll give you some insight when that's all finished. As I said, more to come. Make it a great day.